Well, hey, you know, can I, can I start by telling you guys about a month ago, I made a life-changing decision. And, you know, this life-changing decision, I, you know, like, when I make big decisions, I don't know what to choose, right? So I was, I was like, is it worth it? Should I buy it? If I buy it, am I going to spoil my kids? If I buy it, am I going to regret it? But you know what? In the end, I just went for it. I put the $70 down, and I got Disney+. Plus. <laughs> All right? Decide. You guys need to get Disney+. Plus. Okay. So I got Disney+, Plus, and you know what? I was thinking about how to, what, what is my rationalization? So I was thinking about why I should get it, why I shouldn't get it, and you know what I decided? I was on Netflix, and I wanted to watch the new Star Wars, and I couldn't find Star Wars 7, but there was only Star Wars 8, right? So Star Wars 7 is called The Force Awakens. Star Wars 8 is The Last Jedi. So I was like, should I watch Star Wars 8? I was like, no, I need to buy Disney+, Plus so I could watch Star Wars 7. Okay, to be honest, it's been about a month. I haven't watched Star Wars 7 still, but I just needed that rationalization to get me over the hump and make this life-changing decision, and my kids have loved it, okay? So I have not regretted it. But you know what makes Star Wars or any movie really good? You know, good movies, they resonate with our realities, and the way you tell a good movie is good is by looking at the bad guys, Okay? You look at the bad guys and they resonate with our realities, right? Good movies don't just have aliens or zombies or bad guys. They have host aliens, right? And mama zombies and bigger bad guys than you think, right? So like in Star Wars, right? You got stormtroopers and then you got the bigger bad guy. You got Darth Vader and then you got the ultimate bad guy, Emperor Palpatine, right? You know, and I think that resonates with our realities, I think we see sin, and I, see, I think we see the darkness, the bad guys, the, the bad in our world, and we realize there's a deeper sin, and yet there's even a deeper sin underneath that. And sometimes it's overwhelming because we're fighting off the stormtrooper level sins, but then we start to see, wow, we have Darth Vader level sins in our lives. And then when we hit that, we realize, oh my gosh, there's emperor level sins underneath that. And I think that's what Paul is addressing in our passage today from Ephesians 4. You know, Ephesians 4, again, it says this. I just want to highlight two phrases. The two phrases are that we're, Paul is asking Christians, the Holy Spirit through Paul is asking Christians to put off our old self. And then verse 24, to put on our new self. You know, to put off our old self, I think, in Christian circles is largely ignored, if I could say so very directly. I think we do a good job of putting on the new self, but I just want to mention, I want to point out that putting off the old self actually comes first. And what happens is this, if we don't put off the old self and we only put on the new self, I'm going to say that we're doing it all wrong. But I think that's what we do as Christians. And I think it kind of looks like this. So I think we know on the outside, we're supposed to be really nice to people, And sometimes deep inside, we just don't feel like being nice. So we put on that nice Christian mask, you know, with a smile that kind of looks like this. And we be really, really nice, and we think we're getting people fooled. But what do we do? We're just really, really passive aggressive, aren't we? It's hitting too close to home, okay? All right? You know, and we know know as Christians, we shouldn't curse, right? So instead of cursing instead of swearing we euphemize things and we say oh fudge you son of a biscuit or my favorite one your mother father it's like i have no idea where that came from right (laughs) or you know we have bad boundaries deep down inside and we just can't say no to people and so what do we do we say things that sound christian again and we say hey let me pray about it and then you know two weeks pass you never answer them so it's kind of like a no we just didn't say no to them right or this is my favorite favorite one we want to break up with our boyfriend or girlfriend and we don't know how to do it what do we do it's not no it's not you it's god god told me not to god told me that we're supposed to break up right so you know what i just don't want we're done god told me okay so the thing is there's all these things going on underneath the surface and sometimes what we're doing is we're trying to put things on without really addressing what's going on underneath and again i think as christians we try to address that stormtrooper trooper level sinful behavior. We go down, we realize that there's idols deeper inside. And if we don't put off the emperor level root idols deep down inside, I think we're just doing it all wrong. 
And this is because sin is so deceptive. You know, usually sin isn't simply loving harmful things. It's not simply loving bad things. But what sin does is sin is taking good things and making them ultimate things, right? So we love good things like food and video games and movies and TV and academics and our image, our good looks, and we make them become ultimate things and so they become an idol. Let me say it another way. We take a good gift from the giver and we enjoy the gift so much we clench and we cling on to the gift and we lose sight of why the giver gave it to us in the first place, and so we create an idol out of the gift. And so hear me correctly. An idol isn't simply a bad thing. An idol is a good thing that we've made into an ultimate thing. And so all these good things, all these things in our hearts, we have to understand what to do with them. We have to understand what it's like to put them off as well as put on new behaviors. So today, as we've been walking through the whole semester and talking about what it means to do life with God and with others, I wanna talk about how to make God the ultimate thing for us again. Especially at this time, we're so busy, there's so many things going on, we got lots of papers, lots of tests, lots of chapels, and we, I wanna say, hey guys, as we do all this, let's make God the ultimate thing in the process. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about four root sins, four emperor level sins that are deep down inside. And as we talk about these, these are the, is these four, okay? We're gonna talk about approval, comfort, control, and power. By the way, this, these are not mine. This is from a guy named Tim Keller, okay, for in New York. He's way smarter than me, okay? So if you wanna learn more, find, feel free to look up Tim Keller, okay? But these four root level idols, these emperor level idols, these motivations, we're gonna talk about what they are and then we're gonna talk about how to diagnose them in ourselves and then what we're gonna talk about is how to put them off, okay? And you know what? All the other sins serve these four chief idols. All the other sins, all the Darth Vader idols, all the stormtrooper sins, they serve this, these emperor level sins. Let me show you how this works. Let me show you how this works. We take an idol that people come and struggle with, like money, okay? So with money, I might want money because of approval. Because if I make a lot of money, then people will like me, and people will think that I'm lovable, right? Or it might be because of comfort. If I'm rich, you know, people, I can just hire people to do the things I don't wanna do, like my laundry or make my food right? Or it's money, it can be really b- be driven by control. You know, more money, more options, more ways to set my schedule, and more ways to have control over my life. Or money, the pursuit of money, might be driven by power. The more money I have, the more respect I have, and people actually listen to me because I'm rich. Or take the idol of sex, right? These are common idols that we work through and we struggle with. But we might want sex because we might think that sex will make us feel more loved or approved of. Or we might sex for the pleasurable or comfortable things it provides. We might seek sex because it's all about control or power over other people. Or take an idol that's really in right now. Our idol right now is hurry. I read an article the other day that says that goldfish have longer attention spans than us. Humans have an attention span of eight seconds, Microsoft says, but goldfish have attention spans of nine seconds. So we, we, have, we have a little work to do here, okay? But we, we're in this, we, 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 we serve this idol of hurry, and we might be serving this idol of hurry because we think we do a lot of things, and if we accomplish a lot of things, then we will be more approved of. Or it might be about comfort because if we do, if we're always doing something, then we find the comfort in being busy and doing something because at least I know that I'm doing something. Or we hurry to finish things to gain some sort of semblance of control in our future. Or sometimes we hurry because it's gonna make us feel like we're more accomplished and more powerful. You know, we commit tons of sins, way more sins than we give ourselves credit for. 
But all of these sins a- are animated by these four root idols, these emperor-level idols of approval, comfort, control, and power. And so let's unpack these four a little bit more. And what I want you to do is I want you to diagnose yourself, okay? And most people serve two of these idols, and I'm gonna tell you which two I serve, but I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to diagnose your boyfriend, okay? I don't want you to diagnose your girlfriend. I don't want you to di- diagnose your parents. I don't want you to diagnose your, your roommate, okay? Just diagnose yourself, all right? And I want, to, I want to unpack these four for us, and as we unpack these four, think about what God might be inviting you to put off, and then we'll talk about that at the end of this chapel also. So the first one is approval. Just so you guys know, this is like 1A for me. This is my primary idol, okay? And you know what? I literally worship approval all the time. All the time, right? You know, I don't say it out loud, but if you were to hear my heart, it would say something like this. It would say that, you know, life only has meaning if I'm loved by whoever. Or I'm only worth something if I'm approved by whoever, by Todd, right? (laughs) My greatest nightmare is rejection. You know, others might feel smothered by me because I try to make them love me. Right? My problem motion is cowardice. Since I don't like to assert myself, and because I don't assert myself, because if I assert myself, you might hate me. And so I kind of run away from things. I kind of run away from conflict in a lot of ways. Right? I serve the idol of approval. You know, I started coaching my, my son's basketball team. Okay? And honestly, we suck. Okay? <laughs> so we're... Um, we're 0-3, okay? And they're, you know, they're, they're, they're six years old, right? And we play on a 10-foot hoop. So literally, like, there's only one guy on my team that could shoot it above the rim. So, fi- you know, the other people on my team, they, they, I, you guys are passers, you guys are passers. Just make sure you pass it to Nathan. He shoots, okay? But, you know, I'm trying to get them to play as a team, okay? And, you know, our second game was really, really bad. We lost, like, 35 to 6, Okay? And so, like, I was watching the parents' reactions, and you know what? They were just really, really disappointed, and they're just like, oh, my gosh, this coach sucks. Why is he doing this? You know, and, you know, I felt their disapproval. You know, um, after the game, usually we, we hang out, we talk a little bit, but at the end of the game, they just left without saying goodbye. Then on the car ride home, my wife kept saying, hey, why don't you do this? You have to teach them how to shoot. You got to have them pass better. They got to be more aggressive on defense. And she kept saying over and over all the things that we got to work on. Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore. I blew up. I said, stop. And we started, I said nice words to her. Okay. (laughs) But you know, all the nice words or the really mean words that I said to her, that really wasn't the sin that was driving all of it. I just wanted her to approve of me. I just wanted the parents to say, hey, you're doing a good job with what you have. They can't even shoot right? You know, even as I stand now, you know, I'm standing here. You know, my heart wells with anxiety because I want you guys to think that I'm smart, that I'm funny, that I'm ridiculously good looking, even though I got a bad haircut from Supercuts yesterday, (laughs) right? I want, I don't know 95% of you guys here and in Calvary, but you know, I want your approval of me, even though I have the complete acceptance that God has already given to me through his son. Let's move on. Let's talk about the second sin, the second idol. The second idol is comfort. You know, this is my secondary one. This is like my one B, okay? If you heard my heart, it would say this, life only has meaning if it is filled with pleasurable or comfortable experiences. I will only have worth if I have a cushy quality of life. You know, my nightmare is stress or demands because, again, I just want to relax. Leave me alone. Okay, others can feel neglected or hurt because I do withdraw, right? And my problem motion is boredom, especially since people who struggle with this um, root idol, we tend to numb our emotions, and, there, and we confuse numbing for comfort. You know, during baseball season, I love watching the Dodgers, okay? Especially when it's the playoffs, even though we've been losing, okay? And some evenings, you know, my wife leaves, and I remember about two years ago when the Dodgers played the Astros, even though the Astros cheated, Okay, 
we would, I, you know, I was watching my two kids, and I got my two kids, and I stick them on the sofa next to me. And as we're watching the Dodgers, I'm trying to train them to like the Dodgers with me. So I say, blue team, that's good. Orange team, that's bad, right? And so we're watching, and, you know, I give them milk. I give them juice. And, you know, in the middle of the game, this is baseball. Kids don't like baseball, right? Baseball is boring. In the middle of the game, what do they do? They start throwing the milk and the orange juice at each other, and it just creates a puddle. And then I'm like, you know what? It's okay. I'll just, I'll just clean it up. I'll just clean it up later. Not a big deal, right? But you know what they do? They go into the milk puddle, into their juice puddle, and they start splashing the walls, splashing the, the TV. I'm like, oh, you know what? You know, it's okay. It's okay. I got this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean it up later. I, I want to watch the game, you know. And then my son, the little one, he slips, hits his head on the floor, and what do I do? I have so much compassion. No, I don't. Right? I get angry. I'm like, what the heck? Can you take care of yourself? Go clean it up, you know. And they're three years. He's three years old. Like, what do, what do you do, you know? I'm trying to watch the game. You know, I sinned that day by being a bad dad. But the, the, the root idol underneath it that was driving me was my desire for comfort, okay? Let's move on, okay? These last two are not necessarily my idols, so we're just gonna talk through it really quick, but please, diagnose yourself, okay? This is the idol of control. If this is you, your heart says something like this, my life will be perfect when I have everything planned out so there are no unexpected surprises. I will only have worth if I have mastery over my life. Control's greatest nightmare is uncertainty. Others can feel condemned by you because you control them or because who can control the future? Nobody, right? If control is about holding things together and developing some sort of order, then the last one, power, power, is it seeks to pick everything up, grab it, and manipulate everything so it goes the way you want. The idol of power, if this is you, your heart says something like this, life will only have meaning if I have influence over other people, organizations, or things. I will have worth only if, I'm, if I reach a level of success that makes me respectable. Power's greatest nightmare is shame and humiliation. Others feel used by you. And power's problem motion is anger. So take a few seconds again. Here's a little chart to help you guys. What is your root idol? What are your two root idols? Most of us serve two root idols all the time. What are these two root idols that maybe God is asking us to also put off today, which we'll talk about? Anyone approval like me, kind of? See, we don't raise our hands because we want to be approved of, right? Okay, anyway, comfort, kind of, you don't raise your hands because you don't want to, you want to be comfortable, right? Power, kind of, you guys raise your hands because you want power, right? Control, okay, kind of, all right? Well, let me explain how we put this off, and let me explain this really clearly, and I'm going to say something that might feel a little confusing, might sound a little wrong, but give me a few seconds to explain it, okay? So I'm going to say this. The way we put things off, how do we put these emperor level idols off? You know, I, the idol is not in the way. You know, the idol is the way. Okay, let me say that again, okay? And again, let me explain this, okay? The idol is not in the way, okay? The idol is the way, right? So again, let me explain, okay? When we see our idols, we think it's in the way between God and me. To be with God, we feel like we got to get rid of these idols, and we tend to do one of two things. First, the first thing we tend to do is we see the idol in the way, and we do everything we can to remove the idol and get rid of it in our own strength. It's kind of, you know, that's half the gospel, but who got rid of the idol for us? Jesus. That's what we sing about today, at least here in Sutherland. I don't know what you guys sing about in Calvary, okay? In the second, but the second thing we tend to do, the first thing we tend to do is we see the idol in the way and we try to move it out of the way ourselves. The second thing we tend to do, we see the idol in the way and we realize that it's so big and there's nothing we can do. So what do we do? We withdraw, we run away, we're just helpless and we just give up. And we say, oh well, there's nothing we can do. You know what? The helplessness, that's part of the gospel message. But do we just give up? That's not the complete gospel message. Both, both 
responses capture a piece of the gospel, but the piece of the gospel is not the full gospel. The idol is not in the way. The idol is the way to connect us back to God and want to do life with him. Now again, I'm not saying that we go and practice the idol full force. That's not what I'm saying. But the idol is there to remind us that we need to be rooted in God's approval, in God's comforts, in God's control, in God's power in us. These gifts that God has given us that we've clenched so hard, these gifts that we've made idols, those were actually pathways to understand who God was. And instead of using them for our benefit, what we're trying to do is now we're understanding what is God, why did God give that to us in the first place? See, the idol is not in the way. The idol is the way to bring us back to God. See, the idol reminds us that his grace is still sufficient when we see the Darth Vader level sin and the emperor level sin in our hearts right now. It's still, his grace is still enough right now as it was when he died on that cross. His grace is enough right now, even when it was when we first accepted him into our hearts. See, the idol reminds us that instead of turning these gifts into idols, we can recognize them as gifts again and recognize that we can go to God and surrender. You remember my idol of approval? My idol of approval, um, remember my car ride with my wife? We're driving in the car, we're getting angry at each other, and we're just kind of like getting at each other. You know, after a while, we stopped fighting. And after, I don't know, like three minutes of silence, my wife said to me, she looked at me and said, hey, you know what, Mike? You know the parents of the basketball team? They might be disappointed that we're losing, but you know what they told me? They told me they actually like you as the coach because you don't scream at the kids. They told me that you're doing a good job because you're not super mean like the other coaches. You know, they'd rather lose and have you as the coach because they're, you're the kind of person that they want their kids to look up to. And I was like, why don't they just tell me that? <laughs> right? But you see what happened there? I was serving the idol of approval in the car, screaming at my wife, and then it hit me. God, in his gracious way, through my wife, reminded me, hey, Mike, you're already approved. You're already loved. So, Mike, coach the team because you're loved. Coach the team not to earn approval, but because you are approved. Mike, coach the team with me in mind, not to try to earn something that I've already given you. And that, remind me, that reminder in the car, as my wife said that to me, pushed me back to God. It reminded me to surrender my idol of approval and say, God, I want to live in the gift that you've given me again. And I want to come to you because you're the good giver who's given me approval. The degree to which we, the degree to which we don't live out of God's approval the degree to which we don't live out of God's comforts, the degree to which we don't live out of God's control, the degree to which we don't live out of God's power in us, that's the degree we're tempted to live out the root idols in our heart. So as we close, here's a little chart for us, okay, that reminds us that the Bible tells us these things over and over and over and points us back to the giver and not the gift. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.